First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 24. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading, and Brother Ralph, and leading us in this fine way in these beautiful songs. We're glad to see each and every one here today. Thank the Lord for this privilege. Uh, I do want to mention uh, Langley and Christina. Langley has possibly been exposed to the virus at his workplace, and so he and Christina are staying in this morning, and they're with us on the telephone here so they can hear us. So uh, we hope and pray they will be clear of the virus. I believe last Sunday he was going through a similar situation. So we hope and pray they'll soon be able to be back with us. Also, we want to remember little Lily, beloved of us here, that uh, she has some health things that she's going through that she's going to have to be tested for. We want to pray for Lily, that the Lord bless her and her family. And also Mr. and Ms. Underwood, Sister Connie's neighbors, uh, some of these I didn't know about when I made the announcement to, on the prayer list, Bible study. So let's pray for these also as well as others that we have mentioned and prayed for today. And of course, Brother Philip, we hope and pray that he'll soon be better. Today, my beloved friends, we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 16 to 24. We're entitling this lesson, God's Formula for faithfulness. God's formula for faithfulness. A formula is a recipe or a procedure to go by to accomplish a certain goal. We know that in uh, babies we have baby formula. We have formulas in chemistry and science, in mathematics and in medicine. And we have formulas in various fields. It is a procedure to follow or a step-by-step -step thing to go through in order to accomplish something. God's formula for faithfulness. Of course, the Bible gives us that formula. We want to look at various points here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 24 in our lesson text that will help us in being faithful. God's formula for faithfulness. Being faithful is of tremendous importance. It means to be trustworthy, one that we can trust and depend on, one who is loyal. We serve one who is very faithful, and that is our God. This is stated here in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God can be depended upon and counted on to fulfill His promises. We can put our total, total trust in the Lord without doubt. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In various places in the Bible, we read of the faithfulness of God. Just look at a few examples in the New Testament. In Revelation 19, verse 11, the rider of the white horse. And of course, that's symbolic language, but the rider of the white horse there is Jesus Christ. And he is called faithful and true. That's not symbolic. That is reality. 
the Lord is faithful and true. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, there is a great statement made regarding the faithfulness of God. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. We have the perfect pattern of faithfulness in God. But it pays man to be faithful. To be faithful as children. One of the qualifications of a bishop or an elder, Titus 1.6, is having faithful children. It pays for husband and wife to be faithful to one another. For husbands to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5.25 for the wife to be in subjection to her husband, even as the church is subject unto Christ. Ephesians 5, verse 24. It pays for servants to be faithful. You remember the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25? The servant to whom his Lord gave two talents, when his Lord returned, he said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He had doubled those two talents. The five-talent man had doubled his also. In like manner, he said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. But then there was the one-talent man, whom he calls a wicked and slothful servant, cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, not because he only had one talent, but because he did not use properly the talent that was given him. He went and hid it in the ground. So he was condemned. Along this idea of faithfulness, I saw an interview recently with Vice President Mike Pence's daughter. She's college age or in her 20s. I'm not sure which. But this girl obviously has a lot of admiration and respect for her father. And in this interview, these women were asking her questions and talking with her. And they brought up the Pence Rule. They call it the Pence Rule. The Pence Rule is that Mike Pence will not eat a meal with a lady other than his wife unless there's another person there with them. That's the Pence Rule. And even these worldly people that were interviewing uh, Charlotte Pence, they seem to really like that rule. And that's good. That he will not eat with a lady that's not his wife unless there's another person there involved. We see that in stewards it is required that a man be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2. We read of Timothy being faithful in 1 Timothy 4, verse 17. We read of the faithfulness of Epaphras in Colossians 1, in verse number 7. We also read that Paul addresses the church at Colossae, those who were faithful there. Colossians 1, verse 2, the saint, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Galatians 3 and 9 is an amazing expression here regarding the patriarch Abraham. Paul refers to Abraham as faithful Abraham. Faithful Abraham. And on and on we could go. We know the ultimate reward for faithfulness is the crown of life. Jesus promises, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. And thus we should all be interested in the topic of faithfulness and God's formula for faithfulness. The first part of this I have entitled, In Everything and at All Times. In Everything and at All Times. Verses 16, 17, and 18. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I like the comment that Brother David Lipscomb made regarding this verse, number 16, Rejoice evermore. 
He said Christians with the blessings and protection of God here on earth with His everlasting arms underneath them and with the glories of the eternal world open to them should rejoice always. Amen, Brother Lipscomb. Exactly right. And Brother Off led us in leaning on the everlasting arms a while ago. In Deuteronomy 33, the first part of verse 27, Moses states, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Isn't that a tremendous thought to think that the everlasting arms of God are under us, girding us up and protecting us? The Bible teaches us that we are to rejoice. Jesus said, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy may be fulfilled. I'll have to go back and read that. John 15, 11. Be sure we said that just right. The Lord said there, and there's an important point here to think about, John 15, 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So in order to have the Lord's joy remaining in us and for our joy to be full, His Word must remain in us. The things that He has spoken through His Holy Word. In Philippians 4, 4, we remember Paul's statement to the Philippian Christians, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And in Philippians 3, 3, Rejoice in Christ Jesus. But then Paul said to pray without ceasing. Regarding a failure to pray without ceasing, Brother J.W. Shepherd, who also, along with Brother Lipscomb, wrote in the Gospel Advocate Commentaries on various books, said, Failure, loss of temper, absence of joy, weariness, and discouragement are its fruits. That is, the fruits of failing to pray without ceasing. While prayer brings us without fail the joy and strength of God. How true that is. We are to continue instant in prayer, Romans 12, verse 12. Praying always, Ephesians 6, verse 18. We are to continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving, Colossians 4, verse 2. Do you recall the incident in the Old Testament when Joshua and the children of Israel went over into the land of Canaan and any of their neighbors that were near them, they were to defeat those peoples. They were to conquer them and to, uh, well, take care of them as God instructed them to do. But there was a group of people who were near them but pretended to be from far away because they did not want to be destroyed at the hand of the Israelites. They were called the Gibeonites. And they came before the children of Israel pretending that they had come on a long journey. They made their shoes look like they were worn out and old in their food. And everything, their clothes, made it look like they'd come from a far journey. So that Israel would not do to them as they were to do to their neighbors round about. And here's what the Bible says in Colossian, uh, Joshua chapter 9, verse 14. And the men took of their victuals and ask not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. So, Israel made an agreement not to destroy them. And they accepted them, and later on, shortly thereafter, they found out that they were from nearby. And they realized, because we have given them our word on this, we cannot destroy them. But they didn't ask counsel of the Lord, and that's why they were deceived. They did not ask counsel of the Lord. And how many times do we fall into problems, my friends, because we do not ask counsel of the Lord, because we do not pray without ceasing. Realizing our own weaknesses and shortcomings and dependence upon God, let us pray without ceasing. Those who pray fervently and pray often and without ceasing, are those who realize their own weakness and need for God. And of course, that should be all of us. But then in verse 18, he said, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Another statement made by Paul, and this time to the Ephesians, 
in like manner goes along with this principle where he teaches the Ephesians to give thanks. Ephesians 5 verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always for all things. I've also used this verse to teach brethren that you need to pray in the name of Jesus Christ when you pray. I had a brother one time in a congregation where I was. Sometimes he would end the prayer in Jesus' name or the name of Christ. But sometimes he wouldn't. He would just say amen. This verse teaches that we are to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in adversity, sorrow, and rejection prayed. Let's go back to the book of Matthew at this time in chapter 11, verse 25, 26. In the face of opposition and unbelief, the Lord prayed. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. We are to pray. We are to be like Jesus. Paul said, this is the will of God. God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. But in order to be saved, we have to follow God's formula for faithfulness and the principles that He sets forth in the Bible. We are to pray. We are to give thanks. Another passage that goes along with this is Colossians 3, verse 15 to 17. This is said to the church. And here Paul says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body. That's the church. And be ye thankful. Look at those three words. Be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Another passage that we're well familiar with is Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. Paul says there, be careful for nothing. In other words, do not be overly anxious and worry. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we have many scriptures in the New Testament that teach us to be thankful, to pray, and to rejoice. Now, friends, the second thought in our passage is dealing with God's Word and with what is right and doing the right. Dealing with God's Word and what is right in doing the right. And we could also say in this, shunning the wrong. Shunning that which is not according to God's word. And this will be verses 19 to 21. Here Paul says, Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. This is ever important for the Christian to follow these principles. First of all, quench not the Spirit. We are not to neglect, ignore, or resist in any way the Word of God, the Holy Spirit's teaching. The Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, verse 17. By neglecting and disobeying the Spirit's teaching through the Word, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which we're commanded not to do. Ephesians 4, verse 30. Stephen to the unbelieving Jews stated in his sermon of Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. How did their fathers do? And how were these Jews doing? They were resisting the truth, the Word of God. And therefore, they were resisting the Holy Spirit. One cannot do this and be led of the Spirit. As many as are led of the Spirit are the children of God, according to Paul, Romans 8, 14. But if we resist and reject the teaching of the Spirit, then we are not led of the Spirit, and therefore we cannot be true children of God. 
The implication then is that we must be obedient to God's Word. In James 1.22, But be ye doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. And along this line, in the next verse, he said, Despise not prophesyings. That is, do not count them as nothing. This is the idea of despising or rejecting inspired teaching. Do not reject the Word of God coming to you through inspired prophets. Johnson's note says here, inspired teachings. We are not to despise inspired teachings coming from God. The inspired preaching and teaching must not be despised. You know, sometimes I like to in my sermons, bring out a Greek word that's translated in the New Testament. And the reason I like to do this is because you know that inspired men were given the words of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 2.13. That is, what they wrote was given by the Holy Spirit, by inspiration. And this is one reason that looking at the original words in the Greek New Testament is so interesting and important. It shows us what the Spirit gave. Now, let me say this. We don't have to study Greek or know Greek to understand the Bible and to know or do God's will. But this is one reason it's so very interesting to me to look at what these words originally meant and their translation. The word prove is one of them in verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove is from Dr. Mazzo, and it means to test, to prove. That's the idea. That we are to test or to prove what is spoken, and even that which people are practicing, we are to test that and to prove it according to the standard that God has given us, His Word. What was spoken was to be put to the test. Is it according to God's inspired Word? We recall that the people of Berea in Acts 17 searched the Scriptures to be sure what they were being taught was so. We read how that God commended them through the inspired writer Luke in Acts 17 verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that, here's the reason, they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. The test was conformity in his teachings and prophesyings to the teachings and writings of the apostles was the test by which all prophetic power or spiritual gifts of any description must be decided. If the person did not teach according to the standard, he was to be rejected. In the words of Brother David Richard. Amen to that. The standard was that which the Spirit gave through the apostles. That was the standard. Everything was to be tested according to that. But of course, in those days, they didn't have the New Testament in complete form. And, but when it was completed and recorded, they did have it as we have it today. And we know that the miracle ceased with after the death of the apostles, the completion of the New Testament, when that which is perfect has come, there was no more need for the miraculous gifts. But today we have what we need here to test any practice or any teaching to see if it is according to God's will. Then they had inspired men. They had the inspired teachings by miraculous gifts. We know that John warned against believing every teaching. He said, Beloved, believe not every teaching spirit, that is, every teacher, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. That's the idea there, to prove them, to try them, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. If they needed that warning then, in like manner, we need it today. Sadly, there are many who are not following this injunction. They're just following or believing or listening to anything that comes down the pike. And this is one reason that so much is getting into the church that is not according to the standard. We remember what Jesus said to the Jews 
Search the Scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life. We know that in the Scriptures we find what eternal life is, but many of these Jews were deceived. Had they searched the Scriptures and really accepted what they taught, they would have believed Jesus Christ. But then we see that Paul says here, after saying, proving all things, hold fast that which is good. After you have tested or proven that which is taught those things that you have found to be according to God's standard His inspired work. You are to hold fast to those things. Everything else you are to reject and have nothing to do with. But those things that are tested and proven to be scriptural, you are to accept those things. You are to hold fast to them. Now, I'd like to look at this expression to hold fast or hold firmly to and look at other passages where the same word is used in the original Greek New Testament and see how it is translated. For example, 1 Corinthians 11.2, we find the word keep. It doesn't say hold there or hold firmly to. It says to keep, keep the ordinances. So in holding fast or holding firmly to something, we are to keep it. We are to obey it and do what it says. We find it also used in the book of Luke chapter 8 where Jesus explained the parable of the sower. And regarding the good soil, this is a great statement the Lord makes here regarding the good soil. He said, But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, Keep it. There it is. Keep it. And bring forth fruit with patience. So you see, we're talking about God's formula for faithfulness here. And certainly we cannot be faithful if we do not hold fast to the teachings of the Lord's Word and keep them and do them. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. And I'd like to go over to the book of Hebrews for a moment where this word is found. Uh, at least three or four times the same word that Paul uses here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In Hebrews chapter 3, it is used in verses 6 and 14. In verse 6, But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast, there it is, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Then in verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold, there it is, the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. And then going over to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse 23. Amazing statement here. Let us hold fast, that is firm to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. There it is again. God is faithful. And so we are to hold fast to the profession of our faith. We are to hold firmly unto it. Ephesians 5, verse 10, going back to the first part of this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, prove all things. Paul said, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. How do we do that? Through God's Word. That's how we prove it. We need to do that as individuals and as congregations. To be sure that things are being taught in the church, not just here in this place, but wherever. Things that we're hearing about that are being practiced and brought in, are they according to the Scriptures? And if they're not, we're to have nothing to do with it whatsoever. In fact, we are to stand against those things that are not according to God's Word. We are to oppose them and to be set for the defense of the gospel. Philippians 1, verse 17. I'd like to uh, use here something said by Brother John Shannon, a preacher of the Lord's Church down in Memphis. I like the way that uh, he described these three verses here, or these two verses, verse 21 and verse 22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. 
The idea of proving all things and holding fast that, fast that which is good, that which is proven to be right, and then to abstain from all appearance of evil. He says, examination, continuation, and separation. We are to examine what is taught. And when we find that which is right, or see what is right, and conclude what is right according to the Scriptures, we are to continue in that. We are to hold fast to it and keep it. And then we are to separate from all evil. So we want to look at this last of all. Verse number 22. And of course we'll look at verse 23 in conclusion. But, excuse me, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. This is from the Greek word apeko. And it means to hold oneself from, to keep oneself from. We are to keep ourselves from certain things. Earlier, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Paul taught the brethren to abstain from fornication. In uh, Acts 15, there is what's called the Jerusalem Conference. The apostles and elders, they met over the matter of circumcision because certain teachers going around saying that the Gentile converts needed to be circumcised. And this is what they sent out to the churches. In Acts 15, verse 20, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. And then in verse 29, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Now, we are to abstain from every form of evil. That's the idea here of abstaining from all appearance of evil. Every form of it we are to abstain from. Peter said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. We are to abstain from lust and fornication and from every form of evil, all kinds of evil, no matter what it is. Paul writing to the Romans said in Romans 12, 9, let love be without dissimulation, dissimulation, abhor that which is evil, and cleave to that which is good. Stay clear of anything evil. Have nothing to do with it. Abstain from it. And hold fast and cleave to that which is good. In chapter 14, verse 16, he said, Let not then your good be evil spoken of. We're not to be invo uh, involved in any appearance of evil, any likeness of evil so that our good would be evil spoken of. We are to be careful about our influence, our example, and the impressions that we make, the things that we say and do, the places we go, the people that we run with. We want to be careful that we abstain from all appearance of evil. Not only abstain from doing evil, but from the form of evil, the likeness of it in any way. As we close today, let us consider what Paul said to the Thessalonian brethren. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. God is willing and able to keep us blameless and ready to meet the Lord at the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God is faithful to preserve us and make us holy in every respect, our entire being. Physical, inward man, spiritual man, all of us. We have considered today God's formula for faithfulness. Because God is faithful, we have the confidence as Christians that if we sin, we can go to God and confess our sins based on a heart of repentance, Acts 8.22 that He will forgive us. What a comforting thought this is. We all need this. It might not necessarily be that we need to come before the church and make a public confession. Of course, if one has become unfaithful to the Lord, they need to do that. Or if they have been involved in public sin, that's true. But it could be in our lives that we're having weaknesses and personal sins, and we need to go to God about this. 
John said that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do we not, do we not need that encouragement? I believe that we all do, myself included. We need that encouragement that we can go to God with the heart of penitence and confess our sins. And because He is faithful, we know that He will forgive us. God is faithful to His Word regarding the plan of salvation. That if the alien sinner comes to Christ and obedience to the gospel, that God will do what He has promised He would do. If one comes to God in faith, Hebrews 11 and 6, but that can only happen if one hears the Word of God. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. If one is penitent, if he repents, Acts 17, 30, based on his faith in the Lord and his Word, and confesses Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37, and then arises and is baptized to have his sins washed away by the blood of Christ, Acts 22, verse 16, Revelation 1, 5 that God will save his soul. Jesus made this promise, beloved friends. Jesus Christ is faithful. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. God made that promise to us. He also made the promise to us after we have been baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, that if we are faithful, if we love the Lord and keep His commandments, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. He keeps on cleansing us as we walk in the light. God is faithful, and we can depend on that promise. Faithful is He that calleth you, who also will do it. This morning, if there be any who need to come in response to the invitation, we invite and encourage you to do so while as we stand together and we sing. Almost persuaded now to Supper. Let's turn to number 588. 588. Very good song by Brother, Brother L.O. Sanderson. <clears throat> Tis at the feast divine the bread the fruit of the vine and saints commune before the shrine in the 
supper of the Lord. May we, the Lord, discern His blood, our holy concern. We feast in faith His coming yearn in the supper. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful you have allowed us to come before this table today and remember the death of your dear Son, Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for His body that was slain on our behalf. We might not have to have our body slain. Lord, bless each one of us today as we partake of it that we may understand why we're doing it. Bless these things in Christ's name. Amen. Father, how good I have holy name. Thank you for your son's death on the cross and his blood that he shed for us so we may be saved. And help us to partake of this fruit of the vine in a manner well pleasing in your sight. And help us to remember his blood that he shed for us. In Jesus' name, amen. separate and apart from Lord, separate will give us been and prospered. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we're thankful once again to come here today. Thankful that you're with us. Lord, we thank you for all the wonderful spiritual blessings you've given us through Christ Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, also for material blessings, our, <clears throat> our income, our food and clothing, and shelter, transportation. We thank you for all those things, Lord. Bless these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> 